Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome to another edition of Inside Arsenal. I hope wherever you're watching or listening to this around the world, you're having a very good start to the week. Going to be a pretty quick one today because I'm heading off to London Colney in, well, I've got to leave in about an hour to get there for the day of media activities ahead of Arsenal versus Lons. Tomorrow we're going to get a bit of open training where ahead of all UEFA games, we get to see, when I say we, I say the media, um, we get to see about 15 minutes at the very start of the session. We don't get to see anything, to be honest, because... As you would imagine, Mikel Arteta is not going to give anything away. So uh, the players just walk out. We see them warm up for 15 or so minutes and then we get shepherded back to the media centre. The players do their training session. Then afterwards, Mikel Arteta and a player will head over and do the pre-match press conference duties. So, yeah, as I said, I'm going to head over there in about an hour's time. So I'm going to rattle through this one. I will try, if I can get time, depending on how things go at Colney later, to do a little bit of a video afterwards looking at just detailing what's gone on who i've seen at open training who's injured who's not who's training who's not and then see what Mikel Arteta has to say so the plan is for me to put out another video later on just detailing what's happened during the day but it all depends on time i've got to fight my way back through m25 traffic at the end of it all and get home in time to pick my kids up from their after school club so it's going to be a pretty pretty day but we shall see how it all goes. Okay, wanted to really sort of start today's show looking at tomorrow's game and looking at some of the big decisions that Mikel Arteta's got to make in terms of the team selection. We'll find out a little bit more today at the press conference, I'm sure, um, in terms of who potentially could well be starting. But I think if everyone's fit, if there's no one that we sort of know about who's suffered any injury, I think the big thing is what does Mikel do in that left eight position? I mean, it's been a topic of discussion, hasn't it? Pretty much since the start of the season, he's tried Kai Havertz there. Leandro Trossard played there at the weekend. Declan Rice has played there. Fabio Vieira has played there. So what's he going to do for this one tomorrow? Trossard and Odegaard started against Brentford at the weekend. Of course, Kai Havertz came off the bench, had his big moment, scored the winner in injury time. So does Havertz start this one? Havertz, I mean, I probably should have checked this out before I, uh, before I started press record. But Havertz has played, I think, in... Has he played in all of the Champions League games? If he's not started all four of them so far, he's certainly, I imagine, started three of them so far. Uh, Mikel tends to like him starting in the Champions League, and it does make me wonder whether he will um, he will come in for this one. Trossard has been very, very good in the Champions League so far this season, but of course not really from that left eight position. He's been playing up front for large chunks of it, scored um, in the wins against PSV and the home game against Sevilla last time out, really crucial game against Sevilla, goal against Sevilla last time out, in fact, didn't he, with the uh, with that header just before half time? So, um, uh, no, that was against Burnley. Sorry, I'm getting cut to my game, my Trossard goals totally confused. He scored that lovely finish from Bakaya Saka's cross against Sevilla last time out. Uh, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see Fabio Vieira, of course, is back available for this one he's banned at the moment in the Premier League but he's back available for this game so he comes back in cont into contention I can't imagine he's going to go straight into the starting lineup by any means but he is another option for Mikel Arteta and you could play Jorginho of course and play Declan Rice as the left eight I think someone's got in touch here who is it um cool Sergio 72 seven says Jorginho Rice and Odegaard in midfield against Lons which is a, a midfield we've seen plenty of times so far from Mikel Arteta this season and would certainly be an option. Jorginho was given pretty much the whole evening off against Brentford, came on just those last couple of minutes after Havertz had scored to help tighten things up. He'd played and started both games for Italy during the international break, so that was no big surprise, I suppose. Uh, and he could well come back into contention, was really, really crucial in the win against Sevilla as well, um, Jorginho, and that will just allow Declan Rice to play a little bit further, further ahead. But I kind of look at Kai Havertz for this one, coming off the back of the win against Brentford, coming off the back of scoring, making that big impact, you know, really special moment for him, confidence boost, whatever you want to call it. I look at it and think, you know, is Kai Havertz going to come in for this? I, I've got a slight little hunch that he probably will. I think Mikel will want to try and ride the crest of the wave that potentially he is feeling after that goal against Brentford, give him as much opportunity to really kind of lay down another marker, you know, how good would it be if he could back up that win, that goal with another big moment in this game against Lons. I just kind of feel like if it's going to be between Trossard and Havertz for this one, I think it might well be Havertz. I like Trossard at left eight, but I do wonder if it makes Arsenal a little bit unbalanced in that in that midfield role. You know, Trossard can play anywhere. He's such a clever player. He's got so much good movement. His technique is so good that he can play on the left. He can play in the centre. He can play as an eight. He can play on the right. 
But I do wonder in that midfield alongside Odegaard, if it is as good as it looks on paper and as exciting as it looks on paper, I do wonder if it leaves Arsenal a little bit unbalanced. And either you have a Jorginho and Rice or you have Rice as a six and you have someone like Havertz playing in that position just makes Arsenal a little bit more solid. Um, And I do also think that Havertz, you would hope, the goal at the weekend will really give him the boost he needs to start making those runs to the back post more and more to really sort of show some intent when he's not on the ball getting into those positions where he can really make an impact as we saw in West London. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I will, uh, if I don't get to do a video tonight after the presser, I'll certainly do one in the morning looking at my predicted 11, that sort of thing. And love to get your views that I can include in that video in terms of who you think should be starting in the game tomorrow night. Let me know in the comments below. Um, just wanted to talk about this. Now, I had a, I did a part of the show yesterday responding to questions about Saka and how he's still, you know, despite not playing at his best this season or what we perceive to be at his best, he's still contributing. He's still got great goals and uh, assists um, ratio in games so far this season. And he was speaking after the Brentford game, and I thought these were really interesting comments about the sort of the struggles. He basically admitted that it is a bit of a struggle this season because of how teams are targeting him. And I said it in yesterday's show that every time I looked up against Brentford, every time that Saka got on the ball, it was so, so obvious that within a second or two seconds, he had two, if not three players on him. And it was the same for Martinelli on the other side. Teams are clearly targeting Arsenal because they know that's where their threat is. They know that's where they're so strong and how they caused so many problems last season was down those flanks. And so it's just an obvious tactic to double up and triple up on them at times. And Bukai was talking about them. I thought they were quite interesting comments. He says, I feel like in a lot of games, I'm facing a double team with two guys on me. And it's the same for Gabby. It's happening in every game. I keep watching all of my games back, trying to find a solution, what I can do better. In the end, I just feel like I need to understand that this is how it's going to be this season. And I need to and I need to deal with it and keep finding a way like I did says today because he was speaking in the game against Brentford after the game against Brentford that's what I need to keep doing the managers know a bit more about how we play and it's up to us to adapt in each game and to find a solution of course each game is different but we know that we can be a lot better we're especially working on breaking teams down but we're still getting really good results and we're top of the league so he can be really happy and I thought those were really interesting comments about the issues that Arsenal are clearly facing and they know the issues that they are facing as um, Bukaya says there, you know, they're really sort of trying to work it out during the week in terms of what they can do maybe a little bit differently to counteract these tactics that teams are using against them. Last season, it was all about get the ball out wide to Saka and Martinelli as quickly as possible, let them destroy the fullback and Arsenal can benefit from that. Maybe this time it's, you know, if you've got two players on Saka or three players at times at Saka or the same on the other side of Martinelli, then someone's going to be in space in one of the other areas of the pitch. It's just about moving the ball more quickly to those players so they can exploit that space while the teams are concentrating on Arsenal's wingers. So I thought a really interesting comments from Saka and certainly shed a little bit of a light on what he and some of the Arsenal players are having to deal with. And there is a, I will talk a little bit later on in this show about some comments made by Jamie Carragher about his, you know, how he feels about Arsenal's title charge or title ambitions this season. And um, I think they kind of tie in a little bit to what Saka has to say. But before I get onto that, just on Thomas Party, lots of talk again about Juventus and uh, reports consistently linking Thomas Party with Juventus. I've had my say on those already, you know, at the moment, I'm just. Nothing that I've heard is sort of absolutely back that up, but that is a real sort of, there is some substance behind that and about a desire to leave or anything like that. It's just not what I'm hearing. So um, so I can't really say any more on that, but uh, I know that Thomas is working really hard to get himself back fit and he, he is certainly targeting being back this year. You know, we've still got what, we're coming up to, are we in December yet? No, of course we're not. I haven't got my Christmas decorations up. My kids would certainly let me know if we're in December yet, but we're very close to December now. I mean, and Thomas is hoping to be back before the end of the year so to play again. So he's working really hard to do that. But at the moment, it, there's just no real time frame because it's such a tricky injury to come back from. Um, there's a question here from, uh, obviously, there's no name on who, who it was, but it says, can't help wondering if a party Vlajevic swap is on the cards with Juve. This is obviously in response to all the talk about party and Juve that continues to come out of Italy, that they are really going to try and push for him uh, in January. On Vlajevic, I just don't know. Um, you know, I, I remember that summer of Arsenal. Are oh, they going? They're bidding for Vlajevic. They've bid. They've made multiple bids. All that time, I was being told that that wasn't the case and that he wasn't that high up on the list of targets. He was a player that monitored, but all the talk that we were seeing from Italy about rejected bids and all of that stuff, I was just told 
it's not the case and that Arsenal felt that they were being used by not just Flavic's agents, but by Fiorentina as well to try and get more interest in him to drum up the price tag and that ultimately Juventus would have to pay big, big money, which is what happened. And that's what I was told the whole way. That's why I never really reported that that potential transfer during that summer because all of the noise I was getting was that it just wasn't the case and it was nowhere near as the interest was nowhere near as strong that was being reported. So, you know, I don't know if this would be the case in a party Vlaavich swap. I'd be very surprised. Any sort of swap deals are so difficult to do. And on one hand, you've got quite a young striker with a long-term contract in Vlaavich and then you've got an aging midfielder with a short-term contract in party. So it doesn't really link to being a swap deal if that was ever, you know, to be the case. Uh, here's one from Just Incredible, who I always love that name. It just reminds me of wrestling. And he's talking about wrestling in this. But first of all, he says, what do you make of Jamie Carragher's nonsense about our attacking and our defending? Then talks about Punk. It says, also remember on Collision, Punk said, said, tell me when I'm telling lies. Well, Punk, you're telling lies. He's acting as though he was pining to go back to WWE when he was there bragging about landing AEW, their billion dollar deal. Uh, does he really expect us to believe anything? He said, except that he's back for the money. I don't think he cares. As he said in that promo on Raw yesterday, he's not here to make friends. He's here to make money. And let's face it, a punk in WWE, he's going to make a lot of money. And so are WWE. And to be fair, that's what the business is about. That's what wrestling's always been about. It's always been about making money and getting ratings and selling tickets and selling pay-per-views. And it'll always be the case. And that's why this is such a big deal. And um, yeah, and I'm still very happy that he's in WWE. But in, in terms of uh, Jamie Carragher's comments this is what Carragher said yesterday on Monday Night Football about Arsenal's attacking as Just Incredible was talking about there he said we're still only a third of the way through the season but I think if Arsenal continue how they are if this is the Arsenal we're going to see this season I don't think they can win the league I think so many games are going to the wire and sometimes that can go against you you think of the Ramsdale mistake and the big chance Brentford had in the second half of the weekend those games that finish 1-0 can easily go 1-0 the other way the reason I don't think they're as fluid is that individually the attacking players have been average this season, whereas they were an absolute fire last season in terms of Martinelli, Saka and Jesus. Odegaard for me last season was up there alongside Kevin De Bruyne, but I know he's had a few injury issues. I mean, you can say the same when you say Jesus has been average. I think that's really harsh because just like Odegaard, he's been injured. And when he's played, when he's been fit, Odegaard, uh, Jesus has done some really good things this season. And I think when you say Martinelli and Saka have been average, Again, I think potentially they have compared to last season. But I think as Saka was talking about just now in those comments that I was reading, they're just facing very different challenges this season. And although they've been average, as you say, as Jamie Carragher says there on Bukai Saka, you look at his numbers, you look at what he's producing, and he is still producing unbelievable numbers. And I think that's good. I do think Carragher's got a point. I think if the games, if it continues to be this tight, if Arsenal don't find a way of opening up teams a little bit more and creating more chances, I think they probably will struggle to win the league because as he says, these 1-0 games and Arsenal have won five games, I think, either 1-0 or by one goal this season, um, they can easily go the other way when it's that fine margins. As as we saw, as Carragher pointed out, that Ramsdale mistake, if that goes in at 1-0 and Brentford lead 1-0, then it's going to be a long way back for Arsenal if they're not creating that many problems. So I think he's probably right but the thing that I don't, I don't think Arsenal are going to continue to, it is going to continue to be like that. I do think maybe it's wishful thinking. I don't know. Maybe it's blind hope. But I can't, I just think Arsenal are going to get better in an attacking sense this season. And I think a lot part of that is just down to personnel. I think the fact that they've been without Odegaard so much, they've been without Gabriel Jesus so much, they've not been able to play Saka, Martinelli and Jesus together for large periods of time. Thomas Partey's not been around to break the lines from midfield. I think when everyone, you sort of marry that all up and bring them back into the team, if stroke when it happens, I think Arsenal are going to be much, much better going forward and they are going to win games a little bit more easily. Um, and also, yeah, I, I just think when you've got a defence as good as Arsenal and you're really limited in teams to, you know, a couple at best chances a game, certainly good chances a game, I think with the quality Arsenal have going forward, they will still get over the line and find ways to win, which is what they're doing so far this season. Obviously, injuries are going to play a big, big part. You know, if Saliba gets injured, then Arsenal will struggle. If Declan Rice gets injured, then Arsenal will really struggle. Um, you know, add Gabriel into that mix as well. But if they don't, if they stay fit, then I still think Arsenal are going to find ways to win games, even if they're not at their very best attacking-wise, because they've got enough quality to produce that moment of magic, as we saw with Bukayo Saka picking out that pass 
for Kai Havertz at the last moment against Brentford at the weekend. So I do think Carragher's got a point. I don't think it's necessarily nonsense, as uh, Justin Credible says here. I do think he's got a point. But, you know, I, I just think there's a lot more for, to come from Arsenal this season. And I do still genuinely believe, again, it might be blind hope, that that will start to come out and we will start to see it more in games. The, as long as the attacking players actually finally stay fit and start playing together um, over the next couple of months. Uh, here's one from John, just to, last, uh, to round this off. I said at the start of the season, it would be a really competitive season and the winner might only get 85 points. If we maintained our performance at the same rate as the first part of the season, we would end up with 88. City did, they would end up with 85. Yeah, I agree. I don't think we're looking at a 95 to 100 point title winning team this season, as we have done in recent years. I just look at the strength in depth for the Premier League, the quality of so many of the teams in that top sort of half of the league at the moment. I just think everyone's going to take points off each other. Last year, every single draw felt like a defeat because you just knew Man City were going to steamroller everyone. I don't see that this season. I don't think a draw, I don't come away from a draw, especially away from home in a tricky game. I don't think that's anywhere near as costly as it'll be last season. I think 85 points, again, yeah, 85 to 90 points, I think could well be the title winning number this season. Certainly not 95 to a, to 100. Um I just think it's a really competitive Premier League. I really, really do. I think it's going to be so hard to go away to Newcastle, to go away to Aston Villa, to go to Anfield, to City, to the Emirates. You know, all those two play, all these teams who are going to have to go to the away games in Premier League. It's going to be really difficult to win games. Tottenham away, really, really tough. Chelsea away, we've seen, has been really tough. They've taken points off City. They took points off Arsenal. Um, it's just a really strong league. I really, really do. Teams are getting much, much better. Really, really strong. And so, yeah, I agree, John. I absolutely 100% agree. All right, that's it for me, everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Like I said, I'm going to head off, I'm going to get this uploaded. Then I'm heading off, jumping on the motorway, getting to London Colney for today's press conference and media duties and keep an eye out. Hopefully, I will get another video out later on this evening following on from the events at London Colney. If not, I will definitely be back tomorrow to really look ahead to the game against Lons. Have a great day, everyone. I will speak to you soon. Thank you.